Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. I am Andrea Baer, the Executive Director here at Mendes Park, and we are in the second of our series, the Beyond the Numbers series, which is in the third year that we've been offering this annually to our members. Um, today, we're going to be taking a deep dive into exercise. We all know we should exercise, but why is it so hard to get there? But first, just a couple of notes that I want you all to um, keep in mind as we go through the presentation. All attendees are in listen only mode. You can place your questions into the, um, the Q&A box anytime during the presentation so that we can read them out at the end um, during the Q&A period. Please note that you, if you can't hear, I hope you can see the screen, that check the personal computer's audio because that's usually the issue that people have. But if you have any other needs, please type it in the chat box and Leslie can help you out there. A PDF version of the slides, as well as a recording of this presentation will be available on the Mended Hearts and the National Lipid Association's website following the event. As I said, we have brought this series for the, this is our third year in a row, and we're so excited to have it back this year. Uh, we love to partner with uh, the NLA and the, NAS, the Foundation for the National Lipid Association. So just a moment to let you know about our three organizations. Mended Hearts' mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life of heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education and advocacy. The National Lipid Association's mission is to enhance the practice of lipid management in clinical medicine. And the foundation of the NLA's mission is to improve the welfare of patients and families affected by cholesterol and triglyceride problems. I am very honored to have with us today, Dr. Ralph LaForge is a clinical um, physiologist and adjunct facility, uh, faculty at the Duke University Endocrine Division, and he's a photographer for Nikon Imaging. Um, Dr. LaForge shared that he has been known about Mended Hearts for a very long time, and it's very exciting to hear the history there. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it over. Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Andrea, Leslie, uh, Mended Hearts, um, and the National Lipid Association. Uh, my goodness, I am so glad finally the NLA is really integrating into cardiac rehab education, um, which was um, uh, my earliest forte out of graduate school many years ago. Uh, so I know many of you, if not most, if not all of you are, um, have been in cardiac rehab or have had some level of cardiorespiratory disease. And uh, I'm going to approach this uh, with that as a caveat. However, uh, I'm going to go beyond uh, just giving you cautions because you've had perhaps uh, an earlier heart attack or open heart surgery or a stent or whatnot. Uh, I'm going to go beyond that because many of the guidelines we're going to give you and suggestions would be for anyone as an adult to, uh, to motivate them to move more. Okay, next slide, please. Why? Okay, perhaps the cost benefit is not adequately realized. Many people don't realize the real benefit. If you just said the benefit was weight loss, we know clearly now, gosh, after probably two and a half decades of research, there are clear benefits with or without weight loss that directly affect your heart. Next point. Maybe the perception of what is exercise versus physical activity and fitness is misunderstood. Uh, we're going to speak to physical activity and then and, and a subset of that would be what we would call organized exercise. And fitness is kind of a higher uh, threshold of exercising perhaps at a higher level, which is important, but we're going to really focus on just moving and moving more and moving daily. And thirdly, the great expectations we have, usually that's within weight loss, 
Uh, and of course, performance. People want to perform better and have quality of life uh, measures that are much more enhanced. I have to say though, the vast majority of the patients that I've worked with want to see some reduction in body fat, which can certainly happen even without weight loss. So that's something else to even think about. Next point. The notion that you must exercise in a gym. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm a little strong in that uh, response, but uh, I have spent many years working with Native Alaskans and Native Americans that don't necessarily have to build the gym in order, in order to have those patients and those adults, men and women, get at least a thousand calories of exercise a week in or out of the gym, and we'll come back to that. And last point here, sitting time can influence the motivation and initiative to even become physically active. The more you sit, the less likely you are to get up and move. And that is very normal. And we're gonna hopefully break that, uh, break that issue uh, apart here in a few slides. Next slide, please. So physical activity versus fitness. Any movement, any muscle movement is physical activity. And we're gonna show you a fair amount of information without getting too technical of research over the last five or six years that even light physical activity has a benefit, especially with uh, cardiorespiratory risk factors. Fitness, on the other hand, is what you would be exercising at maybe at a higher level, like above 60% of your maximum effort level. And we know that's important, but we know right now, probably the best option is to spend the slight majority of your week just being physically active and maybe a couple of days a week, pushing the energy expenditure or the speed or the effort maybe a little higher. Even in cardiac rehab, we think that's a, a very, a, it's a very viable beneficial option when it's done safely. Next slide, please. So bottom line, now in the middle of this presentation at the end, just move, move as often as you can even if it's getting up from your chair for 90 seconds. Uh, when you add up those 90 second intervals of the course of the day, there is clear benefit on peripheral vascular circulation. There's clear benefit on certain cardiovascular risk factors when you add it all up. And there's clear benefit to, um, to reducing body fat. Next slide. So one thing you might ask yourself, and I'm, I'm sure most of the cardiac rehab patients listening to this already know how active they are. But if you really wanted to very quickly assess how active you are, next slide, please. You could use one of the CDC's little instruments, the Centers for Disease Control. And to ask you uh, over the course of a day or a week or a month, how much of your activity has been light versus moderate versus vigorous? Uh, Hit the cursor for me. Uh, it's going to just hit the next slide. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so see that 40 to 60% of max effort? There's your threshold, which is probably the ideal for probably 95% of all of us. That is, moderate activity is defined as an effort between four and a six on a zero to 10 scale. Uh, that's not exactly the same thing as 40 to 60 percent of max heart rate, which is a little higher. 40 to 60 percent of max effort is about 55 to 75 percent of max heart rate. But forget that. Forget heart rate for a moment. 40 to 60 percent of your maximum effort level, like fast walking, um, modest aerobic classes, strength training, swimming gently, if that can be done. I can't swim gently, sorry, but uh, many people can. And then vigorous activities would be defined as when you exceed 60% of your maximum effort. Perhaps in the middle of your walk, you might walk faster at near maximum speed. But the magic threshold, no matter how you look at the data, is 40 to 60% of max effort over the course of a week or a month. Next slide, please. So there's two key reasons we don't tend to lose the weight that we think we should in response to this activity. This is quite important. It's been so misunderstood for about 30 years, still is. Next slide, please. So this is a little complex, but um, before we hit the pointer again, I'm going to just say this. 
if you were to walk a mile and the next day you ran a mile, okay, which one would generate the highest caloric value, the highest energy expenditure? The answer would be, if you're taking a multiple choice exam, they're basically the same. If you walk a mile, let's say you walk at two and a half to three miles an hour, that's about three and a half to four calories per minute, but it takes you 20 minutes to do that mile, right? But if you run the mile the next day and you run it in eight or nine minutes, but you're burning maybe eight or nine or 10 calories per minute, but you're only doing it for eight or nine minutes, they're both worth the same, what we call gross energy expenditure. So from, an, from a weight loss standpoint, it really makes no difference in terms of when you compare jogging or running versus walking, when you compare them by distance, you know, miles walked or meters walked or whatever it may be. Now, we're not saying that running or jogging doesn't bring any uh, additional value. It does because it increases your aerobic capacity, and aerobic power. But in terms of energy expenditure or calories spent, don't make no difference. Next slide or next point. So here's, here's the thing I'd like to show you. Let's say you're gonna do 20 minutes of just you know, messing around the house today, what we call activities of daily living. So 20 minutes of just modest uh, fiddling around the house. Um, it's about 25 to 30 calories on average. Hit the pointer again. Well, let's say in this, you decide instead of just fooling around the house for 20 minutes, you actually went out to jog, or I'm sorry, went out to walk at three miles an hour, one mile. That'd be 80 to 90 calories, you know, give or take. So if you're truly interested in weight loss, it's that's a really big deal for you, and you're trying to count the calories that are spent versus walking or running or activities of daily living, you have to consider the net energy expenditure. What that means is the three mile an hour walk, that one mile, yes, it's 80 to 90 calories, but the net difference is you have to subtract out of that what you would have done anyway had you not chosen to walk that fast, that three mile an hour walk. In other words, subtracting 25 to 30 calories. Next pointer, hit the pointer again. So the difference is, and this has stood the test of time, the net energy cost of walking um, uh, a mile uh, or running a mile, it's about 50 to 60 calories per mile walk. A actually, and if you ran that mile, you might burn a few more calories, but keep in mind, whatever you're doing on the treadmill, on a bicycle, or on the, in the gym, or doing yoga, or Pilates, whatever it is, and you're interested in how many calories it costs you, and that's great. That's called the gross number of calories you burnt in that hour, whatever. If you're really interested in how that those, calor those calories apply to energy expenditure and weight loss, you have to subtract what you would have done anyway, which probably would have, wouldn't have been very much, but you still have to subtract that when you do, that's the net difference. Next slide, please. So at moderate walking speeds, the net energy cost for walking one mile is about 60% of the gross cost, and that's what counts for um, weight loss. Now, I don't expect you to remember all those numbers, just understand, I guess, I think the next slide says it all. Let me go to there. Okay, you go to the gym and you look at the life cycle or any ergometer or stationary bike or stair step or an Olympic machine or a treadmill, whatever. It's gonna show you basically the gross cost and that's fine and it's pretty darn accurate, but it doesn't tell you the net cost. It does, you might go back from the gym and say, geez, I burnt 350 calories today and you did, but that doesn't apply strictly to the, the added calories you would have burned otherwise. That is, you would have to subtract what you would have done in that hour at the gym if you, if you stayed at home and not done anything, which would have been about a third of those calories. So um, I'm not taking anything away from these, the numbers that these displays give you, but if you believe them, you tend to add them all up at the end of the week and it may end up being 3,500 calories but only two thirds of that, or about, give or take, is applied to the calories that you're spending for, for, for oxidizing fat and carbohydrate or weight loss, okay? So just keep in mind, that's what I, one of the things I mean by great expectations that we tend to look at these great numbers 
uh, on the stair steppers and the treadmills and the cycles. And uh, they're not overblown, they're just misrepresent what we call the net cost. Next slide, please. One other thing with exercise, and I'm gonna relate it to eating as well. The modern world makes it very easy to out eat exercise, but nearly impossible to out exercise excessive eating. Here, here's a case in point, next slide. Let's take a scone. I'm gonna take an average scone. One scone, as delicious as it is, can, you know, depending on the size, uh, the, the caloric value it can be anywhere from 140 calories in a small scone to a big scone, which is about 500 calories. Next point. So it takes five to 10 minutes to consume that scone. And if it's a bigger you know, scone, it's gonna take longer, of course, 10, 12 minutes. Next. Next. So, next, one more. Okay, so let's just put it this way. That 140 to 500 calories the scone could be worth is about 1.4 to a five mile walk, which it takes 25 to 90 minutes. Let's say you eat the 500 calorie scone. That's about, give or take, about a five mile walk, about 90 minutes. Took you 10 or 12 minutes to eat it, 90 minutes to use those calories. So keep in mind, I, I'm not trying to make people paranoid about everything they eat, but when you eat caloric dense uh, substances or, or nutrients, or uh, in this case, baked goods, there's a lot of energy in that. And if you have to transduce that to walking or the distance walking, it's quite substantial. Um, just, just as a reminder, next slide. Please. So just move and move as often as you can. If you do that throughout the day, you may not need to go to the gym every day, maybe a couple of days a week rather than every day. One thing we like to tell patients always to maintain at least a thousand calories of exercise a week over and above activities of daily living. That's at least, at least. Next slide, please. What is a thousand calories of exercise a week? For most of us, it's between nine and 10 miles of walking a week or about 20,000 pedometer steps or steps recorded on your Android or iPhone, okay? That's in addition to what you do anyway around the house. That's minimum on top of what you do anyway. Next slide, please. So 10,000 calories of physical activities, a variety of examples. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Could be three sets of singles tennis, three hour hike, two, and a half miles of freestyle swimming. Um, one thing that's, one really key thing, if you're trying to really up the weekly energy expenditure and you only have one day a week where you have the most time to do something, what I would suggest is two or three days where you have less time, do something that's worth maybe 150, 200 calories, like a mile, a mile and a half walk. But on Saturday morning, take the hike take the thousand plus calorie hike. One way we did this for Cherokee natives uh, years ago, and it worked quite well. On Saturday mornings, this is in uh, Tahlequah, Oklahoma, we would have the spouse of the patient drive the patient about six miles from home and let them, let them off. And there's only one way to get back and have walk back home. That'd be worth six to 800 calories in that instance. In other words, when you have no choice but to render those calories because you're gonna to have to walk back home, that's, and you do that just one day a week, you add that to the smaller exercise durations throughout the week, it ends up being 1,500 to 2,500 calories a week. And now you're talking some significant uh, weight loss and weight stabilization. So uh, that's a little drastic, I know, but um, that one day you have more time let an hour and a half to two hour effort, as long as it's in the moderate zone and even the light zone, take care of the energy expenditure, as long as it's not the only thing you do out throughout the week. Next slide, please. So the thing that I've always advocated, perhaps this is because I've been uh, so involved with uh, American Indian um, diabetes prevention and, and uh, native Alaskan diabetes prevention, and, and in most of those, these cases, uh, these populations live on just gorgeous lands with variable terrain. If you can find a path in your neighborhood or in your, in your community that has variable terrain and you just walk it modestly, 
you're talking 20 to 30 percent more calories to cover the varied terrain than it would be if you just walked on the flat. So hills can help. They can help the intensity and help you in some cases get to the, the vigorous intensity threshold. Next slide, please. So here's an example of that. Let's say you've got today, you're going to be able to walk two, two to three miles. I would suggest walking the first mile, if you have this choice in your community, on a relatively flat ground at a modest pace. But the middle, maybe the middle three quarters of a mile, pick up the pace to maybe three miles an hour, or just a faster pace, put it this way. And then the last mile, come back down to the very modest pace again, where the middle duration of the walk is much more intensive. Um, you see the track below in the center, uh, the lower center. If you have a high school or junior high um, athletic field anywhere near you, one thing that's kind of fun to do is walk to that junior high facility and just walk figure eights, just slowly, just figure eights in the, the small bleachers, not um, major, uh, you know, NCAA division four bleachers could be and, you know, it could be 120 steps up to the top, but modest bleachers, just taking your time going up one row across and down the next and up the next row and down the next. Do that the middle third of the walk and then walk easily back home. That would be almost the ideal workout to blend both in intensity driven activity, more vigorous activity with light to moderate activity. Next, next slide. So here's an example that what I've just said, there's two approaches here. I can't show my cursor, I can point this out. Um, yeah, see the red line? Okay, just keep it on the red line. Okay, yeah, exactly. Okay, the yeah, all right, for right now, the yellow line, you're gonna go out outside and walk at a light intensity. But every two minutes, you increase on the red line, up and down, you increase every two minutes, you go two minutes, modest and two minutes hard, two minutes uh, uh, hard, two minutes modest, uh, maybe four or five of those, and then come back down to the last, yes, exactly. That's one approach. The other approach, as I said earlier in the previous slide, is in the middle third or the middle fourth of your walk, you sustain a 60, 65, 70% of max effort walk or run or bike ride. Okay, and then come back down. The important thing here is to start and end at a fairly tapered off pace. Okay, what you don't want to do, and you've heard this, you've heard warm up and cool down. You want to get the blood vessels at least five, six, eight minutes to dilate, and that includes the coronary vessels. But if you jump into exercise at the peak and the blue at the very top, you don't give them time to dilate. And if you have chest discomfort or angina, you're going to more likely have it without warm up at that blue at that blue level of the middle part of the walk. So you want to warm up and cool down with a slower pace. Next slide, please. So recently, there's been quite a bit of work in university levels on the value of light exercise. Now, what is light? Next slide. During light intensity activity, there's not noticeable change in your breathing. You can talk and sing. You don't need. Uh, you also don't need to break out in the sweat. Doing activity feels fairly easy, but you do it a lot throughout the day. You're continually moving at least, you know, five or six times an hour, like general housework, like gardening, shopping, walking. Like. It turns out, compared to complete sedentary lifestyles, this has pretty significant cardiorespiratory benefit. Next slide, please. So remember when I said earlier, moderate, Activity is anything of, uh, of 40 to 60 percent of max effort level, and then vigorous would be anything greater than 60 percent. Well, light activity is less than 40 percent, sometimes only 25 to 30 percent, or two to three times resting metabolism. But there's been recent studies that showed, like um, housekeeping crews that have an eight to nine hour shift and they clean rooms in a hotel. Uh, for eight hours, uh, and they don't compensate with scones throughout the uh, throughout the their work shift. It turned out that the light physical activity group, housekeeping group, spent more calories of energy expenditure than three days a week in the gym at, at three to four hundred calories per workout. So light activity 
does help. It doesn't tax your heart rate that much, which I think needs to be done uh, at least a couple of days a week. But overall, the light activity, if it's done frequently enough, definitely has blood pressure reducing benefits. It has an impact on keeping triglycerides down. It has an impact on actually burning body fat, not so much weight loss, but burning, you can, you can certainly uh, lose body fat without substantial changes in the scale weight. Uh, and there's ways to measure that with, uh, beyond just measuring yourself on the scale. Next, next slide, please. So a workout is good. Household activities are good too. And if that's all you can do, you do it five, six days a week, almost continually for, for eight plus hours, then you, you may or may not need a gym, although that can be uh, helpful for other reasons. Next slide, please. So a variety of activities, just move, move often. And even the lower right where the lady's gardening, yeah, she's probably burning a calorie and a half to two calories per minute, but she's doing it for six hours, or maybe not six hours, but three or four hours. Uh, that's the equivalent of being in the gym for 30 to 45 minutes in terms of energy expenditure. Next slide, please. Reduce sitting time. How does this relate to activity? Next slide. Okay, let's say you're still employed, you work at the workplace, uh, you have a seven hour shift. That's probably a little less than you normally would work. But let's say seven hour shift and you move five minutes on the hour. That would be 35 minutes at three to four calories per minute. When I say move, I'm talking about walking the, the, the floor that where you work, maybe up the stairwell to the second floor, down and come back the first floor and do that a couple of times. Five minutes worth times seven, 35 minutes. Okay, that's about 2,000 to 2,500 steps per shift. That's 100 to 140 calories per shift that you would not have burnt otherwise. Now I'm talking five sustained minutes or so per hour. So how does the 100 calories to 140 calories in a work shift relate to, in this case, let's say diabetes prevention? Well, we know clearly that exercise or just movement uh, and I'm talking about all physical activity, is an insulin sensitizer. It works almost identical to the drug metformin, which is the classic uh, diabetes drug. They work almost identically. And uh, so I always would say met, uh, exercise and things like that, it was a metformin equivalent. You just have to do enough. So five minutes on the hour, none of this where you're going three and four hours without getting up. I mean, I know you don't want to do that, but you know what it is when you get very process oriented and get very goal and, and target uh, a project, it's hard to get up. I completely understand that. Microsoft Office, all word processing programs have a timer, but it will, it will key you, flag you every hour that it's time to get up. And you can build that in an, almost every word processing program. You just have to open the options and the, um, the um, the options page for that program. Next slide, please. How about counting your steps? We talked about that, but let's get it more specific. Next slide, please. There's so many physical activity trackers. I've written four papers now on uh, tracking the trackers, as they say, uh, from wrist-worn devices, ankle-worn devices, shoulder-worn devices, and of course, the advent of these great sensors they are now putting in all cell phones. Oh my gosh the sensors now they're using in cell phones are as good as the triaxial, triaxial um, um, piezoelectric accelerometers they use in these expensive pedometers. And these now have been incorporated to many of the newer cell phones. That means the cell phones can track movement in all three planes, not just walking. It's quite impressive. Next slide, please. I have used projects with uh, Native Alaskan children. This is in Barrow, Alaska, the farthest north you can get in the world, or just about um, in, in Barrow, Alaska, where we got the kids to wear uh, pedometers. This is a few years back, but they were going to go outside. They're going to put on one jacket. They're going to do the thing to call run to the sun. The first sunrise of the year in Barrow would always be around Martin Luther King Day. It'd be about 30 below zero. I I could not go outside more than 10 minutes 
I uh, couldn't take my gloves off to take a picture because my fingers froze. These kids could would run on the tundra uh, at 5K to the sun and then, you know, run or jog back to the elementary school. But they were more apt to do it when they got something, some credit for it, like digits or a pedometer count. Even though that doesn't work for long, it's a motivator for about two weeks, it really got them started and interested in step count. Next slide, please. And if you believe it, the Boy Scouts now have a pedometry merit badge, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. And it's an easy merit badge, but they have to do 12,000 steps per day for two months. Even at this age, that's quite a lot. Next slide. Okay, this is quite important. And it can be controversial depending on who you're talking to. If you're using your cell phone or a pedometer counts steps, and that cell phone or pedometer also measures distance and it gives you the caloric expenditure, it's undeniable with all the studies that have now been done that it's most that pedometer or the cell phone is most reliable in counting steps or muscular contractions. And that's what's important. The distance usually is over embellished. It's hard and, and not reliable to measure distance. It's a rough gauge of how far you walk or ran or bike road. And then caloric expenditure is the least reliable. Uh, even though, oh my gosh, even Google Fit, which I love on the, all the Android phones, reports all these caloric expenditures, oh my gosh. It is so variable, but what they do very well is count steps. And why is steps important? Next slide, please. One way it's important is because we know now that if you put on uh, a pedometer or you look at your cell phone, at the end of the day, if you have, if you can put that pointer on the red line. Okay, if you are under 5,000 steps in the, in the uh, wakeful day, you are sedentary. The ideal is to get to at least 7,500 steps, ideally 10,000 steps or more. The younger you are, the higher step count is required. And why are steps important? Next slide. I think that's my next slide. Oh, no, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, my wife and I were um, garnered for a research study in 2017. We were one of the first uh, couples to actually scientifically for very long distances compare uh, a cell phone step counting process versus an AccuSplit 2720, which is uh, my wife's on, on your right or her left hand. Um, so... I used a pedometer, she used a cell phone. So what did we do? Next slide, please. So we walked the Southwest Coastal Trail of Cornwall, England. Oh, drop dead gourds. I'm not saying this, you have this view in your backyard, but we wanted to go a very long way. Next slide, please. And it was undulating up and down, but it was walkable. You didn't climb any cliffs or anything. Next slide, please. So what we found out, this is the Cornwall to Southwest Coastal Trail in 2017. Uh, the whole trail, which was 155 miles, uh, she took three, uh, um, 308,000 steps. On my um, pedometer, I took 314,000. And you would say, well, that's a little bit off, isn't it? Not really, because she takes fewer steps. I'm a little shorted. I mean, she has longer legs than I. We're about the same height. It came out to be identical. And most of the other paired studies have shown exactly the same thing, that whether it's an iPhone or a Google or an Android or, or Samsung, whatever it is, the sensors are almost always made by Sony. and they, they count steps just about the same way. So yes, as much as I hated to admit it at the time, the cell phone sensors are darn good at measuring movement. Uh, and they do it better than pedometers because they can measure movement in all three planes, up and down, sideways, and forward and backwards. Uh, since then, we've uh, walked uh, several times the Camino de Santiago from a variety of ways on, in Spain on the Camino Trail with uh, 130 to 255 miles with the same results. So we know now that yes, if you keep your cell phone in your back pocket, as long as it's not loose, 
It has to be, just like the pedometer, has to be fairly snug in your back pocket or your forward pocket. It can't be jungling around in your backpack. Next slide, please. I said I would come back and say, why are steps important? Oh my gosh. Every step you take is an AMP kinase activator. And that is the central process that drives the good works of metformin, the drug metformin that helps improve prove insulin sensitivity with the diabetic patient or anyone. Uh, and it has so many other benefits. Every step you take has a multiplicity of micro benefits that are transduced ultimately to risk factors in the heart. So really what we want to do is count the steps. Yeah, you can count distance and time, sure, but steps really is the real thing. It's measuring the muscle contractions regardless of the distance. Next slide, please. So as Sting has sung, every step you take, I'll be watching you. And it's so important. Next slide. So right now we're saying adults, whether you're cardiac rehab, unless you are non-ambulatory, uh, we're still trying to get an average of 10,000 steps per day. I'm not That's about five miles of walking, but remember we're not saying walk five miles of the day, per day, but 10,000 steps per day includes what you would do around the house and maybe a two or three mile walk on top of that. And that would be at least uh, 10,000 steps. Uh, six to 19 year olds, uh, most of the new uh, uh, guidelines recommend at least 12,000 steps for um, uh, middle, middle school and through teen years, ideally. Next slide, please. Here is um, Amanda Perdrut, who just fin uh, published a paper in December, University of Massachusetts. And just one line here is the yellow line in the middle of the, this abstract. Participants taking at least 7,000 steps per day compared to those taking fewer than 7,000 steps uh, per day had a 50% to 7% lower risk of mortality. And most of these uh, adults, were over 2,000, were coronary prone or with coronary disease. Now we're not say, saying if you go on to 10 or 12,000 steps, but you don't have further benefit. But what we now know is that if you can't do at least 10,000 steps per day, six, seven, 8,000 steps is quite significant in helping reduce a variety of risk factors that relate to longevity. Next slide, please. Uh, just a few years ago in Alaska, one of the most novel programs ever done for nutrition is having native Alaskans who were at the time very diabetes prone to eat more native foods called the store outside your door. I plagiarized that in a program I call next slide. The gym inside your door. What if you're homebound, yard bound or house bound? What can you do? to increase energy expenditure and perhaps getting some, something accomplished. Next slide, please. Diverse types of activities we said earlier, movement, labor, do count. Next slide, please. Diverse types of light to moderate exercise is also associated with lower incidence of coronary disease and diabetes, as we said earlier. Next slide. Yard work, gardening, painting. Next slide. So what we ended up doing with native Alaskans that had pretty harsh weather, especially in the Aleutian Islands with the wind on a calm day, the wind's blowing about 35 miles an hour. Um, so we would have them do, we would write a prescription, have the health aid, write a prescription, it would be a circular circuit. Each of those squares, those boxes, the health aid would write in something to do in around the house, it's cleaning, scrubbing, pushing, washing, laundry, hanging clothes. Um, uh, ordering things around the house. And each one of those blocks would be like a 10 minute activity with a break of maybe a minute to two minutes between each of those stations. One circuit would be equivalent to almost 300 calories if you did it all at one time with only maybe a minute or two between each station. So not only was it a way to get use domestic activities in a circuit type of gym type of activity, but you got something accomplished as well. Next slide, please. 
So that circuit could be anywhere 20 to 90 minutes. There is a online on Facebook. I have a whole, uh, it's, it's just a three minute video that plays a cartoon of that process. You don't have to go to that, but it just outlines what that can look like. Next slide, please. So my final slide is something that you have just uh, somewhat of a summary of what I've said uh, about getting exercise. The thing I would say, number six, is talk to your doctor. If you have coronary disease, obviously he or she needs to know, your cardiologist or internist or family doctor needs to know what you're doing, at least a, a fair idea. In some cases, they may ask you to have a stress EKG. Most of you had this, and most of you are probably cleared for moderate activity, but that's something that's very important. But I would behoove you to read all of these to make sure if you're just now starting exercise, uh, this is a good cheat sheet the way you can begin. And last slide, summary, try not to out eat. Exercise, activity, calories, it's so easy to do. Steps trump distance on pedometer steps, movement, also contractions. No sitting longer than an hour before a physical activity break. Utilitarian household chores do count. And mixing low, moderate, and high intensity exercise like the middle third of the walk, pick up the pace or walk some stairs like a figure eight in a short uh, set of high school or junior high bleachers. Last slide. Just move and move as often as you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great information. Uh, and it's interesting to me that you can burn just as many calories walking as you can doing really stressful activity. So that's great to know. You just have to do it longer, right? Well, as for the same distance. For the, for same, the same, yeah, right. All right. So we do have some questions from the audience. And before we get started, I just want to remind people that if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section and we will moderate that question out. The first question that is in the queue is, I have low ejection fraction. Will exercise help me increase my heart ejection? Very good question. Um, it depends on how low. If you don't have heart failure, and you, I don't know anything about you, it can help if it's very modest, uh, but it's how low it is. If it's below 30%, uh, you can still benefit. That's what cardiac rehab's for, and then once you've done it safely in cardiac rehab, to do that on your own. Um, here's the other thing. Um, not in all, but in most cases, ejection fraction increases a little bit as you exercise more vigorously to a point. Okay, that point, I can't tell you what it is, it's for you, you don't want to go beyond that, but it's usually a point of where you may be very short, suddenly very short of breath, or certainly chest discomfort. So yes, you can. I, I would tend to stay on the low end of moderate and the upper end of light exercise. Um, and one thing I like about stationary bicycles, it's non-weight bearing, and uh, it might be a little safer, you know, cycling. Okay, so this question is um, watching the sugar and garbage carbs, as they say, uh, <laughs> intake way more important than watching calories as a whole. Is that correct? Wow, <laughs> you're talking to an exercise physiologist. <laughs> um, it depends on volume, and and I'm, I'm aware of the data, but. Um, well, if you're diabetes prone and you're not excessively overweight, that's, um, I'm not sure that's totally true. I think total calories as a whole makes more sense. But if you're, if you're more prone to uh, hyper or hypoglycemia, like reactive hyper or hypoglycemia, or you know, you're pre-diabetic and you know you are, um, I'd stay away from the quick fix calories, you call them garbage calories, you know, what we call rapidly absorbed calories. Here, here's an example. I, I can't think of a faster absorbed glucose, which would run your pancreas crazy with four shots of espresso with, with, you know, three teaspoons of sugar in the coffee. 
in the you know, so when I see these vente coffee drinks that are loaded with sugar and cream and caffeine, caffeine's not bad, but when you add like you know, 150, 200 milligrams of caffeine on top of that load, that's excessive. And I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but that is probably not good for anybody uh, as, as often as you see it. Right. All right. Um, so I have heard my tropopin level, I think that's how you say it, is high, was high at times of stress. Is, this, is that the same as the description in your slide with the muscle movement with steps? I didn't understand the, the what, what the level, what, what was it the called? Tropopin, tropamin. Boy, you got me. Um, I don't know, Andrea. I don't know that term. There's always new terms. Uh, and what's the bottom line, though? Is it what? What was the comparison? Is it um, what? I guess that the, the, I would think that the, during the high times of stress, your body is producing <laughs> Yes. Yes. I would think it is a hormone. And yes. it's not the same as when you're moving quickly, your muscle movement with your steps. Do we think it produces the same hormone? Maybe we don't know the answer to that. Well, high levels of emotional, quick react, what I call hot reactive personnel or anger management is the best example because it's research likes to use that because that's where you're not exercising and you're really producing a lot of cortisol or stress hormone. But if you produce that same cortisol stress hormone, because you're right, you're in a spinning class, you know, you're really riding hard and doing vigorous exercise, it has a whole nother effect, which is uh, not detrimental at all. It's, it's quite beneficial. The problem is the stress hormone production with, with no activity, no way to release it. And guess where that goes to clamping down on your arteries and you, you, your blood pressure rises faster. Uh, a number of other hormones are released in response to the cortisol, like you know adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, yeah, um, but you know, keep in mind, if you're talking about stress and the substances it produced, it doesn't have to be typical aerobic activity. There's numerous new, uh, well, not new studies, on yogic-based exercise uh, to reduce stress hormones very quickly, almost in real time, faster than medications can do it. Um, so meditation's that way too. But keep in mind, again, if the, the substances are produced by stress, most of them are also produced with higher level exercise. And in those cases, there's no issue at all. Uh, because they're pretty much depleted, you know, when you cool down. Okay. And I guess they sent a clarifying chat that tropin is a type of protein found in the muscles of your heart. So, uh, What's the name of the protein? Tropin. We don't, oh, I, they're, they're not. There's really a perilipin. There's a perilipin. I, I don't know that one. And that could, I, I don't know, but you're saying that those proteins might have some relationship with stress? Oh, gosh, I don't know that. And, and, and it certainly could be. I, I don't know. That's fine. Yeah. Right. We tried to stump you at that one. <laughs> yeah, no, of course, of course. Exercise and eating properly. Can it reduce or uh, reverse diabetes? Reverse. That's a good question. You ask any diabetologist or endocrinologist, and two will say you can, you can stop the progression, and two will say uh, you can reverse it. But it takes a, um, what's a good word for it? Uh, you're going to have to walk to Anchorage and back for it to happen. <laughs> no. Um, yes, you can. If you are newly diagnosed diabetic and you just meet the minimum criteria for diabetes in terms of glucose and the other numbers, uh, being very demonstrative with energy expenditure, we're talking at least 10,000 steps per day and more, where your glucose then drops and your body weight drops, yes. But some diabetologists believe once you've reached the threshold for diabetes, you always have diabetes. That's sort of the way the, the insurers look at it too. Um, but physiologically, yes, you can reduce, um, re I hate to use the word um, reverse, but yes, it, it does regress. 
until which time you add the weight back and the glucose comes back. So yes, you can, you can, but it takes more than light physical activity, or, or let me put it this way, it takes more than a thousand calories of exercise a week, probably closer to 2,500 or so, which is not really hard to do. So I, I, it can be. Right, right. <clears throat> this question is, can you share the importance of resistance training to supplement aerobic activity as you get older? Yes, very good question. Absolutely. You want to maintain muscle mass, which you lose every year after, well, basically every year if you do very little after 55 years of age, you want to maintain muscle mass and helps, helps basal metabolism, et cetera. Yes, uh, there's a, a quite a bit of research on this. Uh, here's, if you can spend two, probably not more than three days a week, for at least 20 minutes doing at least three different exercises for at least three sets in the gym, you know, weights or weight machines. And those exercises are divided between upper body and, and lower body and using the larger muscle groups. Um, you will definitely gain protein weight. Uh, you may lose a little weight, a fat weight, but you'll gain protein weight, that's why when you do a lot of resistance exercise, you might find you don't actually lose weight on the scale. You actually have lost fat weight, but it's offset by the muscle weight you gain on the scale. So you might not so much difference. So absolutely, I'd say two days a week, at least 20 minutes in the gym, you know, personal trainer or cardiac rehab specialist can tell you exactly what you need to do, but I would divide between upper and lower body. Um, uh, exercises to do that. And uh, the, only, the only thing you never want to do in the gym, and I see it done with the big power lifters and so occasionally with cardiac rehab patients where the uh, instructor's not looking, is they go to failure. They put so much weight on the weight stack or the machine where they, re they, they have one more rep to do and they can't quite get that rep and they just hold it. Oh my gosh. You, you don't want to go to muscle failure, not because of the muscle, that puts quite a strain on the heart, even for a healthy normal. So, but absolutely, resistance training is important. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, I have a TAVR valve. Does intensive exercise have a deteriorous effect on bovine valves? Have you heard anything about that? Serious effect on what? on a deteriorous effect on the oh. on the valve itself if they on have the a valve on the valve i don't understand that word the b-o-w-e-l bovine yeah that's the of a of a cow valve like that they placed in now, not that i yeah um we, well you have to define what intensive exercise keep in mind intensive exercise to most physiologists or something significantly greater than 60%, whether it be in the gym on a weight stack or running on a treadmill. Usually it's above 80%, close to max. Um, it has definite benefits to in increasing aerobic capacity. And if it's a weight machine or whatever, to increasing muscle strength, no question. Uh, but it comes with a little bit of a cost risk-wise if you've had significant vascular disease, okay? And it's really not necessary. So you can still increase muscle size and muscle strength without going what I would call 85 to 100% of your max effort. If you stay at 60 to 75%, you still reap many of those benefits. But I don't know any other de deleterious effects. There may be, I just haven't read about it. Okay, great. So how can you tell if weight gain on the scale is fat versus muscle? <laughs> how, how can you tell? Because I'm always curious about this too. Um, um, yeah. Gaining weight is muscle or is it just? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Been either. around 40 years. I don't know. I don't know. But I can say this. I mean, there's a lot of fancy um uh, uh, processes where you can measure uh, body fat and body, uh, you know, lean muscle mass. Um, and a lot of it's very accurate. Um, the, the way we did in the clinic, the quick way is triceps skin fold. 
right there. It was used to be one of the demonstrative um, uh, indicators of obesity. If you got more than 30 millimeters on your tricep skin fold, and 30 millimeters is pretty big. Um, we don't use that now. What, what I have taught uh, clinicians for years in rural clinics, they can't, they don't, can't do underwater weighing or near infrared re refractants, these fancy machines with electrodes all over you. Um, if you buy a set of $250 set of Lang clinical calipers, and there's other manufacturers too, these are calipers, you know, like little pliers, and they measure skin fold in millimeters. So if they, at baseline, when the patient first starts the program, they would measure two or three sites, like tricep, the umbilicus on the side, and maybe right off of the, uh, right in front of the hip, right in the front of the foreleg, as three examples. You measure those in the calipers, add up the millimeters, and then as that patient progresses in his program over the year, those, that, those total three sites in millimeters, usually 100, you know, like 90 to 100 millimeters should drop down here. And that doesn't tell you about muscle mass because there's no discernible way to measure muscle mass in the clinic. There's just not, unless you've got a, a very expensive apparatus. But what you can do is measure changes. And remember about half of your fat is going to be subepidermal and the rest of it's inside the abdomen, you know, inside the organ, but half of it, give or take, is, is right under the skin. And in theory, whether you're exercising that arm or not, it all, when you burn fat, it comes a little bit from everywhere. It doesn't selectively go just here or there. What they call, used to call selective body fat reduction. There's a little bit of controversy with that, but in general, when you lose fat, it's a little bit of an average between the lower limbs, the abdomen and uh, the upper back and the arms. Now, let me just say one thing. Some ethnic groups store more fat in the abdomen and that's somewhat it resistant to oxidizing. And, but they can lose weight elsewhere. So if you think for a second that you can selectively just only focus on waste fat, although you can reduce waste fat, but if, can you selectively do it? And that's the only place you wanna focus on, Probably not, but you don't really need to. From a risk reduction standpoint, it's the sum total uh, of fat. And again, it's gonna to relate to total calories of energy expenditure, total steps, you know, total steps, total contractions, total distance. Um, that's what it's gonna to relate to more than it. And stay away from the scones, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we have two minutes and I have two really good questions. Um, that I want to get out. The first is what type of exercise would you recommend for people who have bad knees or have a really hard time walking? Um, total knee replacement because <laughs> I did it and that's why I walk so far now in these tr tracks that I did. Um, okay, um, cycling for sure, uh, cycling for sure. Uh, and yeah, weight bearing, if you're going to be a hiker, and over hills and whatnot, it's just not gonna work if you have significant osteoporosis or osteoarthritis, it's just not gonna work. It's gonna generally have to be non-weight bearing. A, a treadmill be okay, but a bicycle would be a better stationary cycle uh, or a rowing machine or whatever. Um, or one other thing we just say, maybe 30 seconds on the treadmill and 30 seconds off, 30 seconds, in other words, no long, long distances uh, at your body weight on the knees, just intervals. Right. And the final question before we close it out is how effective are those foot peddlers and things that people have under their desk for them who work at desk jobs? Yeah, those are light, light activity. There's a number of studies using them. Yeah, exactly. Uh, where you, you like if I had one under my desk right now, absolutely. Um, I would prefer walking because it's weight bearing. It's a, probably a few more calories because you're having to carry your weight, but absolutely over the course of a work day or an hour, uh, you probably burn 50 to 100 calories, you know, um, and it's non weight bearing, so it should be fairly easy, but especially for the uh, osteoarthritis patients that have bad knees. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and for everybody watching, Thank you for joining us. Um, our next session in the series is next week, April 20th. 
Um, and this one's going to be all about medication compliance. We know we should take our medication. Why is it so difficult? Um, so join us right back here. And um, thank you, Dr. LaForge, for joining us and for sharing all of your amazing knowledge and fabulous pictures um, along the way. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you.